that's a joy b size satx um my name's duncan macklin i am the co-founder and ceo of operandus i'm also a partner in echo ctf dot red that is a cyber range feel free to go out there check it out play around with some of our challenges see what kind of badges that you can acquire all that great stuff i'm also the host of cyber speaks live a cybersecurity podcast series with some of the most amazing guests from this community the same community that you're partaking in today so uh be sure to check that out wherever you listen to podcasts so with that being said i'm going to jump right in to things uh We're going to skip the whole bio stuff. I've got a lot of content to cover with you guys. This should actually be like a half day, full day workshop, but we're going to try to condense as much of it as possible into this 45 minute window. So uh, my contact information is on screen. I'll have it again at the end. Don't worry about things like taking notes or anything. I've got great speaker notes with you know, all the same kind of stuff that I'm going to be talking through. There's a link at the end of my slide that you'll be able to download the PowerPoint with the speaker notes immediately after this presentation. It's one of the things that I like to do as a presenter is make that stuff immediately available to you. Don't worry about note taking. You can just follow along and uh, download the speaker notes afterwards. Okay. So moving forward. Um, The first thing we need to really talk about is the stages of incident response. So as we look at how we prepare our organization to handle a cybersecurity incident, you know, we need to understand the stages, but unfortunately the incident response authorities can't seem to come to a general consensus, if you will, on the exact phases of incident response you know so whether if there's four five six even seven phases involved uh depending upon which framework you're using they all seem to share you know some version of the core elements uh of identification containment eradication and recovery uh, those are like the four common elements now they may be grouped into some other phases depending upon the framework but uh you know the precursory and resultant phases like preparedness and and lessons learned you know some of those add to the number of overall phases but essentially all the frameworks are the same it's just how they group these and how they term them um you know, things like containment, eradication, and recovery as one phase, or detection and analysis as another. You know, that's the case with organizations like NIST, for example. Uh, so regardless which framework you adopt, there are many um, of them out there. The important thing is to adopt one of them and stick to it learn the phases and what's required to move from one phase into the next. And that's really not just going to be a a aspect of the team that's assembled, but also the executive sponsor needs to know what is required to move from one phase to the next and should be familiar with all those phases because ultimately your executive sponsor, and we'll get into this in more detail, but they're going to be responsible for making that determination. Uh, Now in the speaker notes, I do include several different examples of the frameworks that are out there, and you'll see how they differ on the naming conventions, the number of phases, how they group uh, tasks that are required into particular phases. So be sure to check out those examples. Moving on, Um, conducting an incident response risk assessment should be one of the first aspects of creating your CERT team and putting them to work. And an IR risk assessment is not 
a, and when I say IR, obviously I'm talking about incident response, but I don't want to use acronyms without explaining them. So our incident response risk assessment, you know, it's not just a vulnerability risk assessment like we commonly think. Uh, this is not a technical assessment, but one that's based on organizational risk and primarily those that get grouped into one of four categories, and those would be legal, financial, reputational, or operational. And unlike our traditional assessments that looked at things like how our networks and systems and data may be attacked by cyber criminals, IR risk assessments look at what is the fallout if they are successful, you know, what are we going to have to deal with? And what is the risk, the financial, the legal, the, the uh, reputational risk to our organization if they do have a successful attack? And depending upon which type of attack it may be, what is that risk level? Now, the output of this IR risk assessment will be what the incident response team um, executive sponsor uses for threat classification and prioritization, which again, we'll talk about it in a bit, but uh, that's essentially what this resulting assessment report will provide them as the details about how to classify and prioritize the risk uh, to the organization as we've talked about. Now, these risk assessments may also be part of whatever industry you're in, where you're conducting business, where you are headquartered, um, who your, your suppliers, who your customers are. All these things can have an impact on what state, federal, or industry regulations may require a risk assessment and most notably and most recently and when i say most recently i mean this month if we look at what has transacted with the recent cyber attacks against the united states pipelines the output of that or the outcome i should say of that is new directives coming from the tsa who is responsible for the u.s pipelines and their safety uh they've just put forward a new cybersecurity directive that does state in addition to some other very aggressive uh directives regarding notification timelines which we'll talk about when we get to that section um being able to name two at least cybersecurity coordinators that are available 24 7 around the clock and responsible for the cybersecurity of the owner operator of that pipeline but in addition to that they've got this 30-day window from i think it was uh, may 28th to be able to conduct this uh, cybersecurity risk assessment based upon their existing cybersecurity controls and best practices. And they only have a 30 day window to complete that assessment, do a gap analysis, and provide remediation recommendations for their own organization back to the TSA and CISA. So um, you have to pay attention to what industry you're in. You have to pay attention to where you're conducting business, where you're headquartered, et cetera, because you may have various state, federal, uh, European Union, or industry regulations that are dictating what has to happen when it comes to these types of assessments. So keep that in mind. And again, one of the things that I do want to call out, if there are any questions, uh, we are going to have the volunteer help with fielding those towards the end, but feel free also if you want to dump them into uh, our Discord channel for track three in the clouds, just be sure to at me, InfoSec War, 
And if we don't get to the questions and I'm able to complete them all to during this session, I will go to Discord and make sure that I answer all of your questions today. That's my commitment to you. All right, so moving on. Uh, setting up and creating your cybersecurity incident response team. So, uh, but before we get into the specifics of creating your first CERT team or maybe reforming your CERT team based on some of the things you learned today, let's discuss just a minute the criticality of having executive sponsorship because it is so important. This doesn't matter if you're a Fortune 500 or you're a security team of just one, you're going to have to have some form of executive sponsorship before you can start down the path of an incident response program because that executive sponsor will approve hopefully in addition to some budget for you and being able to do this, but they're going to approve your mission statement. And we're gonna talk about that next. Uh, the roles that we'll discuss as well here in just a few minutes, but also prioritizing the threats and assign threat levels to attacks or potential attacks against your organization. So this person is typically of the CIO or CISO class and will approve moving between phases of an incident response. So you're going to have to have those uh, or, or have that support from an executive sponsor that has the authority to implement these changes, approve budget, as well as handle the critical decision making that goes into your incident response. All right, so next, hopefully being B-Sides SA, um, SATX, I should say, San Antonio, Texas, my current location. Um, Hopefully you guys recognize the Alamo here, but it was obviously a, uh, a mission before that. So let's talk about the mission statement that I had mentioned earlier. You know, this is basically a unifying mission statement that can help ensure everyone on the team understands the why of what's happening. You know, Simon Setnick uh, talks about the significance of the why, and I'm doing air quotes for those that may just be listening and not seeing the video here. But the why in what we do, and particularly, particularly when it comes to incident response. Now, I've linked to Simon's TED Talk in my speaker notes, and uh you'll be able to download that today and listen to his i, I want to say it's a short you know 15 16 minute ted talk and i'll have that linked in the deck but you know be sure you understand the why and that you're able to communicate that your mission statement doesn't have to be a dissertation though you know it could be as simple as something like the mission of xyz corp is to rapidly and effectively address all cybersecurity incidents with a well-vetted response plan that reduces our organizational risk and protects our shareholders, whoever they may be, right? Uh, the important thing is that you have one that is collectively agreed upon and signed off by your executive sponsor. Um, and again, I'll have Simon's talk about the importance of why am I talk notes and you'll be able to download that immediately after this so when it comes to roles to assign um boy those look good i have an eight today i'm really digging those roles but anyhow when it comes to roles to assign i'm just going to throw some of these out there and some of them are pretty obvious the ones that aren't i'll give a little bit of talk to but in the time of 
or in the interest of time, I want to be as brief as possible with these. But, you know, you're going to need a team leader. Now, the team leader is just that, a team lead. It is not the executive sponsor. You're still going to need that CIO or CISO level uh, executive. And if you're a really small company, it may be your CEO. Uh, I, I feel sorry for you if you are that security team of one because you have a lot of shit on your shoulders and I'm not trying to pile more onto it, but think about these roles because if you are that team of one or maybe just a team of one or two, you're going to have to take on a lot more burden than say an enterprise class organization that has a full security team and other departments that they can pull from. But we have our team lead, we have our CISO or CIO caliber. Risk manager is one uh, that may be in that executive suite that you need to pull from. Same thing with a privacy officer, if you have a uh, data privacy officer. Legal counsel, cannot get away from having legal counsel, whether that's internal or external, you have to have legal representation. Same thing with HR. Uh, customer service, if you're in that kind of uh, situation where you do have a large customer service organization, you're going to need some representative from them because if this does go public, if it is that kind of incident, you're surely going to see an uptick in customer service calls or emails that are going to have to be handled. So make sure you have a representative for customer service and that you're pro providing them information on a need to know basis. They do not need to know everything because again, they're going to be communicating with the public and that can get very dangerous. Be sure whatever you do provide to your customer service agents or their representative, that it has been cleared by legal counsel and your executive sponsor. Finance may need to be involved. And I think in light of recent events with ransomware, payments being made, which I am not a proponent of. I'll be very clear about that. I have my reasons. And if you want to get into the debate of whether or not to pay ransomware demands, let's take that offline. But I'll be more than happy to have that debate with you politely. Um, finance may need to be involved. Uh, there may be budgets being spent on incident response handlers external resources that you need to bring in. I'm going to talk specifically to those later on. They definitely will need to be involved if you're making a ransomware payment, um, but be sure you have finance involved. Business continuity. If you have a business continuity unit within your organization, you need their participation. Uh, we've already talked about the executive sponsor, IT, without a doubt, needs to be involved in your CERT team, as well as a uh, DPO. If you have a data protection officer, they're going to need to be involved, typically because it involves data breaches, data leaks, uh, you know, double extortion schemes, you name it. Um, so be sure your DPO, if you do have one, that they're a part of your CERT team. Again, any questions on these, you know, feel free to hit me up in Discord. But those are the most common groups that I do see participating in CERT team structures and um, for different purposes and cause. Now, again, if you're a one or two person security team, you're going to have to assume some of these responsibilities on your own without the support of obviously those departments. Excuse me, just wetting my whistle. All right, moving on to establishing communication channels. Now, this is different than a communication plan, which we'll discuss next, but comm channels are basically those bilateral comm feeds that we're likely going to need to help with our CERT team efforts. And these may include, you know, inbound threat intelligence feeds, whether those are open or closed source. So you can get threat intel feeds that you can subscribe to or free feeds that fit into things like sticks and taxi so that you can have a free threat intelligence platform or a tip 
as they're commonly referred to, or you can subscribe to feeds. You know, um, I don't want to throw any vendor names out there, but there are, you know, several predominant feeds that uh, these vendors provide. And they're basically just going to supply you with indicators of compromise that will help you understand if your company or if your industry are likely targets for an ongoing cyber attack that's going on in the wild. You may also want to participate in these as an outbound supplier of IOCs, maybe in a closed loop with others within your uh, industry or, or sector, vertical sector, um, you know, to be able to help one another protect and defend. It's kind of a closed source. Think of it like a networking group, right? Everybody trusts everybody. Everybody shares information. Business guards are, are being swapped. You share best practices with each other, that kind of stuff. It's the same thing except with the threat intelligence uh, of indicators of compromise that are being shared between these organizations. You may also need to set up internal distribution lists that receive inbound uh, notifications or to be able to share information amongst yourselves on the CERT team about different security elements, whatever it may be. And of course, if there is some kind of cybersecurity incident, you may be using that internal distribution list as a way to communicate. And then there's also regulatory authorities that may have their own ways of communicating with those that are subject to their directives. So you will want to look at those and see if there's any types of you know communication uh, channels that they have set up, whether if it's an RSS feed, a, a tip or, or threat intelligence platform feed, something that feeds into sticks or taxi. Maybe they have an RSS for you know some blog that they publish to, whatever the case may be, but just look at it and understand what channels exist for yourselves. Um, then there's the need to establish a backup form of CERT team communications in the event that your primary, you know, uh, phone systems, email systems, your Slack, you know, whatever the case may be, if those are what has been compromised, you may need to have a backup for those, uh, in which case you may want to use something like a third-party VoIP system, a SaaS encrypted device application like Signal, pseudo slack discord whatever the case may be as long as that's not the platform that's been compromised in your cyber attack okay so uh creating a communications plan now this is one of the, the most critical aspects of the cert team besides the actual responding to an incident setting up your communication plan is really going to be one of the success or failures of how it is perceived that you have handled a cybersecurity incident. Let's go back to Equifax. You know, there's a reason why there was a change to Equifax to Equifax if you will, um, during a lot of the online discussion of how they handled that cybersecurity incident. Let's just face it, it was a complete cluster from the get-go. And it all had to do with how they communicated what was going on and the backpedaling and the multiple story angles. And it was just, by far one of the worst cybersecurity incidents that I've ever seen. Now, in contrast, I want to say the organization was Fox IT that deals with cybersecurity and they got breached themselves as a cybersecurity organization, yet the way that they handled theirs and the communication that they had with the entire community, how transparent they were throughout the entire process was amazing. They 
got it right. You want to be one of them. You do not want to be an Equifax. So uh, assign a cert team communications officer and a cert team comms office, right, that establishes with authority, let me repeat that, with authority, who says what, when, and to whom. And this includes things like the media, shareholders, employees, partners, customers, uh, clients, as well as the state, federal, and industry regulators. And, you know, let's talk about that list. The FBI, the Secret Service. Many don't understand that the Secret Service do a lot of cybersecurity investigations. Um, your state attorney's offices, the CCPA, or the uh, California Consumers Privacy Act. Uh, you know, you have to know not only what regulations are applicable to you, but you also need to know what the notification requirements are for you communicating to those regulators within their defined timeline, what is going on and how you are handling that cybersecurity incident. With, C with California, you have 72 hours to report that incident. Yeah, that's not a very long window. Same thing with the uh, EU's GDPR, you have a 72 hour window to notify their um, DPO or DPS, excuse me. New York, DFS, part 500, same thing. I think there's, I'm getting confused. Uh, I think there's is either 48 or 72. I wanna say it's 72 hours though. Uh, but they have their own requirements. You know, we talked earlier about the Department of Homeland Security, which has TSA and TSA and CISA have to be notified within 12 hours. 12 hours. You have half a day to get your shit together and let them know what's going on. That's not a lot of time. So you have to almost have this stuff templatized and ready to go, which is part of setting up your communications plan, knowing how you're going to respond to each of these or types of organizations. Um, some of the other things that you'll want to do as part of your communications plan is conducting mock interviews, right? And playing the devil's advocate, having someone really push the envelope when it comes to the types of questions you may be asked by the press if you're working for the type of organization that would need to go public with this type of uh, security incident. Yeah, you know, so go through those mock interviews and you know let your communications officer that's been assigned to the team really get put to the test on how well they're able to handle themselves under the duress of three or four people asking the, you know, different questions all at the same time, because that's how these press conferences go. When I was with the city of Atlanta's ransomware, you know, response team, you know, the mayor would sit there in the middle of the city hall um, entry, entryway, their forum, and give a press release every day or a press conference every day about how they're handling it. And then it went to legal counsel and CIO, but um, you know, know how you're gonna handle those kinds of interviews. Uh, as far as internal and external do's and don'ts, you know, the one thing I, I did talk already about customer service and being sure you're limiting information that they're provided. Same thing with internal employees. It is on a need to know basis. Um, and, and it's not that they're not trustworthy. It's just for a company wide communication, it is need to know basis. You want to limit the risk and exposure of potentially saying the wrong things. Uh, there was one incident involving a financial organization. 
and a bank teller said the wrong thing to one of the customers and next thing you know this thing's getting blown way out of proportion and what ended up getting into the press was not accurate whatsoever but again it's because of company-wide communications when it should have been need to know basis um okay uh, compromised channels obviously you have to be careful in making sure that you understand the scope of what has transpired what you're dealing with because the last thing that you want to do is start having your cert team talk about how they're handling the incident response over a potentially compromised channel so if you are dealing with an active attack against your organization you may want to immediately go to that fallback communications network that you've set up whether that's through yeah, pseudo, uh, Slack, Discord, whatever app or service you want to use, but you may want to fall back to that immediately, not knowing if your email servers or your VoIP system, whatever has been compromised. Okay, incident classes, classifications and threat levels. You know, this again is really back to the CIO and CISO and the importance of them being able to assign those threat levels and knowing based off of that continuous um, you know, risk assessment that you're going to do every six, 12 months, you know, they're going to get to understand these threat levels, know the assignment, and as uh, incidents start to occur, particularly if you're having to deal with multiple threats simultaneously, not only are they going to be assigning the threat levels, but they're also going to be prioritizing the the uh, the responses based off of those threats. So again, all that's based off of the risk to the organization as perceived by that those you know from the executive suite essentially. Okay. One of my favorite things to talk about is jump backs. Um, we have to have these jump backs ready to go. This is basically your bug out bag, except you don't get to bug out of this situation. You just have to deal with it, right? So this is a physical bag. Um, how many of them exist in your organization depends on how big your team is and how often you want to be responsible for carrying that bag and being responsible for its contents. So um, you should have at least two of them, one to remain on site, one to remain off site with whoever is the steward of that bag for that rotation period. Uh, the stewards are going to be members of the CERT team. They are responsible 24 seven for that bag. If there is a cybersecurity incident, that means they have to be on call as well. And that's typically the case with most of the CERT team members, but particularly this one. Um, and it could be any person on the team, just as long as they're responsible for the bag and can bring it to wherever you're going to huddle up in your physical or virtual war room. The reason you're going to need this bag is you don't know what the level of impact is going to be to your infrastructure within the organization, right? So if we're dealing with something like the city of Atlanta's attack, where um, now that's public record and everybody's pretty much been briefed on what all transpired and it's public information um their entire environment was just toast the sam sam ransomware took it down active directory took down workstations took down servers it didn't give a flying flip um so we were starting with nothing my badge which i wish i had brought it out here to show you guys uh, it had to be printed off like a, uh, not a dot matrix, a 
color inkjet printer. It's a horrible looking badge, but then it, they use one of those lamination kits that you can go into Office Depot and buy. That was my badge for like the first week to get around this completely locked down city hall and everything. Uh, so you're gonna want some of the contents of this jump bag to be immediately available day one. Hard copy of your incident response plan documents, uh, network cables, notebooks and pens. You, know, you may not be able to take notes on normal computers. You may have to go back to pen and paper. USB storage devices, digital cameras. You know, we had to use little digital cameras to take people's photos print them off on a uh, portable printer scanner, which is one of the other items that should be in your jump bag, and then scissor cut the image and paste it onto that badge before we use the little lamination kits. You're gonna need this kind of stuff. Digital camera, sound recorder, uh, you may want to use that for note taking, you may wanna use it for meeting records, etc. Uh, we talked about the portable printer scanner, fully patched laptop, and a tablet to walk around with. You're also going to need an iPhone, preferably for added security or just a burner device. But there needs to be a charged, ready-to-use phone, fully patched laptop, tablet, portable printer scanner, etc. You get it. That's your jump bag. There should be two, one on-site, one off-site. Stewards are on call 24 seven, ready to jump with that. Tabletop exercises, another great, great use of your CERT team's time. Um, you know, creating and sourcing exercises for you guys to go through doesn't have to be a heavy lifting. I've done the effort of searching for and linking five different sets of tabletop exercises that are in my speaker notes of the slide deck. So you'll have those. Uh, you can also just Google for them or actually DuckDuckGo for them. And just look for cybersecurity plus, you know, tabletop exercises. That's how I found all these. Um, you can also look for Amanda Berlin on YouTube. She's got a great couple uh, videos on tabletop exercises there. Now, the frequency and duration of these, it's going to be up to you guys to decide. But normally, you want to do, let's say, one a month and keep them short, you know, 15 to 30 minutes each. Yeah, you know, you're wanting to think through the purpose and intent of the exercise. Look at some of those that I've provided in the speaker notes. Um, come up with your own, but try to keep them short so it's not this daunting task and arduous heavy lifting that your team has to go through. You want them to be excited. You want them to have fun with this. Be engaged and, and you know participating in it. You don't want this to be a dreadful kind of thing. It should be fun. It should be, uh, I guess, thought provoking, those kinds of things. But also be sure as you're doing these tabletop exercises, as you learn things about yourselves, your team, your organization, and your cyber resiliency, update your cybersecurity incident or response plan to reflect those lessons learned. Okay. Um, Getting close on time here. Preserving digital forensics. Uh, let's talk about this. So really when it comes to handling the digital forensics of a cyber attack against your company, there really, really is a need to engage a specialist for this. So if you don't have a certified DFIR expert in-house, you're definitely going to want to consult with one early on in your CERT effort. So you have them um, ready to go if you do get hit by an attack. Um, many of them will actually conduct a free or you know, sometimes paid workshop just to help get your retainer to keep them you know, on the ready. So feel free to ask them about that, even if it's not publicly stated on their sites. 
Um, now, one of the things that I want to call out when it comes to preserving your digital forensics, you know, something not to do is, and I know the knee jerk reaction is to shut down all systems, but really it's best to try to VLAN or segment your compromised systems or, you know, disconnect their LAN cables or turn off their Wi-Fi signals so that you can preserve as much of that physical evidence as possible while still containing the malware and not allowing it to spread. But keep that in mind that as soon as you shut down these systems, they start to lose the digital forensics, particularly stuff that may be still resident in memory. Okay. Uh, last bit, and we're fixing our wrap up. So I know we're just a couple minutes over time here, but engaging outsiders talked about that a little bit earlier. And there are many outside experts that you may need to call in as part of your incident response. And as valuable as those folks are, the time to build those relationships and formalize contract agreements and stuff is not during a cybersecurity incident. You know, um, it's best to shortlist your top prospects well ahead of an attack and get those agreements redlined and executed, you know, early on so that they're on retainer and ready to go. Sometimes you know, that's going to involve paying that retainer fee, but knowing the likelihood of an attack is, you know, very likely, you're gonna have to just make that call on your own. Um, but some of the outside, sorry, I um, don't know what happened there. Oops. There we go. Um, some of the outsiders may include insurance carriers, you know, your cybersecurity insurance, they're going to need to be engaged early on. Outside legal counsel, if that's necessary, forensics investigators, your regulators, you know, 12 to 72 hours, not a whole lot of time. Law enforcement agencies, we talked about those earlier. Uh, crisis communications or a PR firm, if you're dealing with a, a customer centric type of attack where data has been leaked and those kinds of things you're probably going to need to have a crisis communications company or a PR firm engaged uh, response vendors simply to stand up the environment we had six different response vendors as part of the city of Atlanta's uh, response can't disclose who those are right now but you know keep in mind, you're going to need those as well and other third parties as needed. So, you know, make sure you've got those contracts set up, retainers established, teams ready to go so that if you get hit, you can start dialing, you know, those numbers and getting those folks engaged. All right, folks, uh, we're a couple minutes over. I do apologize for that. Okay, so one of the questions asked, do you believe that enterprises lack a way to share information after attack? What can we use to solve this issue if this is one? Yes, that is a big, big issue, issue. With, the with the security industry. industry. In whole. Nobody wants Nobody to talk wants about to what they use. use. Oh. A way for organizations to say, in a redacted form, an anonymous form, what happened, how they were hit, you know, what systems were targeted, and what their response was. Anything that I've seen, if anybody else is aware of a resource like that that would allow for organizations to sh freely share redacted information or anonymous information about how they got hacked um, by cyber criminals. Hacking is not a crime, I get it. Let me just talk. Uh, <laughs> but um, I don't know. If, if anybody knows anything, pop it into Discord or into chat here. Alonzo saying, why not use USERT? Um, 
you know, that's fine for disclosing to them. I think the question is more sharing openly with the community and the level of details that would be required. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good fit. I appreciate everybody's time today and uh, thank you for sitting in on the talk. Enjoy the rest of your B-side San Antonio, Texas. As a native, not native, but as one living here myself, I want to be sure that we extend a warm welcome and thank you for everything that you guys do to be part of this community and make it thrive. Even amidst a pandemic. So, thank you.